Hello and welcome back to another exciting adventure of Clarissa Explains Everything, The Monkey Problem. Today we're going to be looking at part two, when humans get involved. In this we're going to be talking about um, why we interact with the animals and how we do in terms of like capture and uh, that sort of thing. <clears throat> there are some non-graphic images in here of disease, of like distress for injured animals. I try to keep it pretty PG though. So to start with, how do these chuckleheads get their hands on the monkeys? There's a couple of different ways um, that the macaques can be trapped. We can do cage or live trap method. And this is really, really common in situations where we want to take them alive um, for relocation or for sterilization, that sort of thing. Um, I work with these kinds of traps a lot when I am dealing with the cats uh, that I am rescuing right now. I'm working with a local family that has a feral cat colony problem and we are slowly collecting and um, neutering or spaying the adults and keeping the kittens for uh, new homes. And this is what we use. Darts can also be used, but there is a little bit of a caveat. These darts are going to be either tipped or, you know, tranquilizer darts that are full of some sort of material that will incapacitate the animals. <clears throat> Here's an example of the um, Aspera Authority down in Angkor Wat doing a relocation of a couple of problem animals. This was very targeted, too. They only captured the ones they wanted. They left the rest of them there, but there were some that were being problems. We'll see one of them in a little bit. Snares are also used to capture these. This is a, I think, less official method of catching this. This is what the poachers use, typically, are snares. And if you're in a survival situation, snares are great. But that's not really what's going on in most of these cases. And of course, there's also this thing, and I'm going to call it a betrayal of trust now, and then I'll give it its proper term here shortly. Um, but, you know, they come in and they will, and this here's this absolute tool um, who's sitting here and isn't even going to, gonna like, uh, deny anything. I've got blank some food to try and lure who to follow me. He says it right there. That's their goal. They feed them specifically so that they can get them. And then a lot of times they will give them poison food or drink. They'll get them used to being hand fed and then they're very happy to take anything they're given and will eat it even if they can taste something off in it because it must be fine the people are giving it to me. They really want you to think that they're rescuing these animals, and I just want to clarify that that is not what's happening. They are definitely not rescuing that little baby. I guarantee that all that fishing line got onto that baby because they put it there. They're full of it. And this one, it's very obvious. Somebody taped this baby up and stuck her in a garbage bag. So this is, this is them doing it and then trying to pretend that they are the heroes, and they're not. Typically, when they have a newborn baby or a really tiny baby, it's the result of matricide. Now, when we're looking at the capture, the live capture, and this is kind of the big one, uh, bonus points if you recognize the situation that is being pictured in all of this. These are at um, Phnom Tamau, or not Phnom Tamau, Phnom Bros, um, in Kampon Sham province, and uh, they are doing a, they called it kind of a cull in the videos, but that's not what's happening. Um, typically, when they're doing these live traps, they're going to be do it for a relocation because it is very time consuming and there are far easier methods to kill them rather than to just take them. This is a humane method. Um, sometimes they'll even put like a stick under the door so that they don't get their tails caught. Uh, depends on the animals, honestly, and the people doing it. And like I said, this is almost always done when they're going to be relocated or sterilized. Not if they're going to be killed, because there's no point. And I was very distressed, I'll say, that when I first saw the one in Phnom Bros, I was very upset, you know, because there was that one baby and mom that everybody loved, um, and I was worried about them because they were gone, but they were relocated. I don't believe for a minute they were actually killed. The other nice thing about this particular setup that they're using here is it tends to keep moms and babies, at least, together, because the moms carry their babies. The babies rarely get very far away from mom, especially in new situations. They always run back to their mommy. Um, so they're not going to be separated. So when the VOs, jerks that they are, were saying that a bunch of the moms were taken and the babies were left, there's no way. There's no possible way on earth that that was happening. That's nonsense. They killed the moms so they could take the babies. Guarantee. 
And like I said, this is this is a situation where they're not going to be killed because it is really time consuming. And there's a lot of personal risk involved in doing it this way. I mean, you can see the gal in the bottom left. She's reaching down and interacting directly with the animal and they can bite. They are scared. They get aggressive. But there are so much easier ways to kill them if that was what the goal was. Um, they could easily use darts or give them poison food and drink and then just walk around and pick up bodies, but they're not doing that. They do dart some of the more aggressive adults if they have to, but they're darting them with a non-lethal compound. So they're still relocating them. They're just doing it a little differently. Now the snares, as I've mentioned, this is kind of a tool of the poachers. And, you know, some of them could argue, well, they're doing it for their survival. The problem is they're doing horrible, horrible things. They're abusing animals. They're inviting infections. They're causing all kinds of problems for themselves and everybody else. And, of course, what they're doing is very illegal even in their own country. So even the people around them recognize they shouldn't be doing this. And they're still doing it. A basic snare is simply a loop of rope or cord of some kind that is set up so that the game can get caught in it. In this picture, we're looking at one that's set so that a fox or a rabbit running through the game trail there will run through that loop and it'll tighten down around their neck and catch them. Others are set up as grab traps like this one right here, where the animal reaches through the loop to grab something, but when they pull back, the loop tightens and they can't get out. They're smart, but they're not that smart. You know what I mean? Here's another one. This is a stump tail that got her arm caught up in there. And you can see the arm has gotten quite swollen um, because the blood's cut off. I mean, it's just bad news. And they'll be left as one of the biggest problems with snares. Like you can use snares responsibly, but you have to check them regularly, like daily or more often than that. Honestly, I think every, you know, ha twice a day would be good but they need to be checked regularly. Otherwise they become very inhumane because the animals are left with these traps and snares on them to suffer. And you can see this little one here has a mechanical trap that's been on that arm for a long time. Um, and the arm has gone necrotic and they're going to lose that arm. If they're lucky, they'll survive. Um, and then this is another one of the grab traps, but this one's a little bit more, I don't want to call it clever, um, but it's a little more complicated. The idea is the animal reaches down in there and grabs whatever and then is stuck, right? Because hand is caught. But if the animals are left in these traps for any amount of time, they end up getting maimed pretty badly. Um, because the cord digs into the flesh, they'll end up with an incised wound like that. And here's the other side of that where the skin is all broken open. And you can see that the hand is black because it is gangrenous. It is dead. The hand has been destroyed because these people left that ligature on too long. Here's another one who has lost the arm for probably the exact same reason. And this little lady was caught with it around her midsection, as you can see. And it, that wound goes all the way around her body. So she was left dangling at her chest by this rope that was cutting into her for probably days before they came back and got her. Another one, I think this is one of the ones that had a mechanical trap on the arm, and you can see how badly that arm has been chewed up. Probably not going to get to keep the arm. And, of course, another big problem with these, and another reason that you really need to be checking them regularly, is that they are indiscriminate killers. They're not going to select for just the prey you want. They're going to get anything that comes through them. A house cat can get caught just as easily as a stoat or a weasel. And sometimes they're bigger traps. And this is deliberately done. They're catching these giant animals, the megafauna. It, and these are the charismatic megafauna. These are the ones people come to that country to see. And they're catching them in these snares and killing them. You know, again, you can do it for survival or you can do it because you're a twit. Survival for just a jerk, right? So there's a lot of different things that can get caught in these. And it's really, again, it, you just have to check them regularly. If you're going to use snares to hunt, to do it correctly, it cannot be this whole leave them there for days to die. Now let's give this its proper name. This is not really a betrayal of trust, but it is. It's called grooming where they feed them. They make them feel comfortable over time. And then 
once the animal is comfortable with them, they swoop in and they'll take advantage of that trust. It's the same technique child predators use. So here he goes. Giving them treats. The other one figured out what was going on, but this little one was not fast enough. And these idiots... Idiots are sitting there laughing at themselves. They think they're hilarious that they're abusing and teasing these animals. <clears throat> now, poison food and drink, they like to use three-ish chemical compounds to poison the animals as a rule. And like I said, with the grooming behavior that they are doing, with the way that they are treating these animals, they get them very used to taking food and water and whatever they have. Um, and they will just cheerfully drink it because they're used to it. But they will also be laced with poisons. One of the main poisons they like to use is 1080, which is sodium fluoroacetate. It's a very aggressive poison, causes foaming at the mouth, agitation, muscle convulsions, all sorts of things. Um, here's the chemical formula, and for my chemistry wags, name the functional group. <laughs> That's an acetate group. Ketamine is another favorite, and this is typically a veterinarian medication. Um, but it gets used a lot, both as a poison, where they overdose them on it, um, and by the people who have the animals captives, they will feed them ketamine to keep them mellow. Um, and there's one in particular who's really notorious for that, we'll see later. So here's the chemical structural diagram for the ketamine. Again, chemistry wags, we've got a benzene ring. A cyclohexane, well, it's not a hexane because that's going to modify it, but, and our uh, amine group on there. The other ones are just a variety of different opioids. We've got hydrocodone, oxycodone, morphine, that sort of thing. Um, and we know that they're not great for us either, and they can cause all sorts of problems, and they can kill you, obviously. So that's what they use them for. Ketamine is really a big one. And like I said, we're going to come back to that when we're talking about the animals as pets. I make finger quotes when I say that. <clears throat> and here it is again, just to, the examples are endless of this behavior here. We've got a rhesus macaque and the rhesus macaque are usually the most aggressive of the four that we've looked at. And this one has been so acclimated to these people that she's letting them touch her baby and that is not a common occurrence they typically do not allow anybody anywhere near their babies unless they've been experiencing a lot of grooming which is again a thing child predators do so they want you to think that this is a rescue oh this poor baby the mom is dead the mom abandoned it we just found it like this whatever how did it get into this house with a collar already around its neck we must rescue it no, you're not. Um, this one in the bottom middle is particularly funny to me because they've got this burn and they claimed, oh, the baby was left after the mama got caught in a fire, blah, 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 whatever. But if you actually watch the video, which I don't recommend, you'll see that the burn section is only like two meters across one way and about four the other direction. So it's just a little teeny tiny burn patch that they were trying to play off as a big fire. And that's not what happened. So they're very obviously lying. It's not a rescue. They want you to think this baby is just so grateful. Oh, you've come to save me. Thank you for rescuing me. There's a collar right there, by the way. Um, like I said, so this animal was put here by humans. Definitely not saying thank you for rescuing me. Probably saying you murdered my mom and ripped me from her still warm arms because that's probably what was happening. So that's garbage. And here's kind of some examples. These are moms. These are all mama monkeys. Start in the bottom left, and she is holding a baby that is obviously dying. That animal has been hit by a car. Um, and the mom is still hyper protective and very aggressive with anybody trying to get near or take the baby. We're going to move up to the top middle up here. And we have another mom with an injured juvenile. Not even a baby baby, but a juvenile. And the VOs are purportedly claiming they're going to take this baby to the vet. Now, do I believe they're taking them to the vet? <laughs> no. They're not. They have a little fake veterinarian clinic that they like to pretend they're using, but it's not really a vet. Um, they're full of it. But she is very aggressively not wanting to let go. And it took three of them to get that baby away from her. I wish she'd bitten them. Um, like the one in the top left is doing. That's another mom who this woman was just walking by. She got too close. Mom lunged, bit her on the leg. Just like the one in the bottom middle. 
mom was being fed but got too close to the baby and mom bit the person. Um, the two on the right are a little bit more mellow. We have a long tail mama on the top. The VOs are just messing with and touching her baby. Because she's been so acclimated to them, they've been grooming her for a long time. She's not getting aggressive, but she's also not just letting them take her baby. Um, she's not going to be separated from them. They don't get separated easily. And then the bottom left, or bottom right, sorry, um, the mom and baby that some of you are very familiar with. I want to highlight her little arms, and you can see the incised wounds there caused by the snare that she was caught in. So it wasn't even that her mom was caught necessarily in the snare, but she was. And her mom stayed with her and allowed herself to be captured rather than abandoning her baby. They do not just dump their babies for no reason. Typically, when you're seeing these channels come up with a new baby you know, a new orphan, it's because of matricide. They've gone in and they've killed the moms. Because remember, they love to feed and water them. They give them treats all day and they're used to taking them. But if you look closely, right there, you can see that that particular mama has foam on her face. So that's 1080, right? And they had given it to her in a water bottle. There's the lid to it, by the way. And eventually she succumbs to the combination of poisons. And the VOs go, oh, no, it's an orphan. Behave yourself. There it goes. Oh, no, it's an orphan. We have to rescue it. And this baby, you can almost see on its face, it knows it's screwed. Because it's with these monsters. Monster. Monsters. And, of course, this is, this is one of Arose's points, but this is taking place in Cambodia. And this is the same channel as a lot of these Monkey Rescue channels that posted this particular picture. And Arose asks the important question, why should the message be in English? It's not the major language there. Some places put English on their signs, but most don't. At minimum, this should be in both languages. So the reason they're making it in English is because they want to get Western views because that's where the money's at. So the best thing to do is not watch their crap. Which I try to avoid as well, but I, I have my means. So why are they doing this? Why are they capturing the animals? Why are we just anyone interacting with the monkeys in these places? There's a couple of legitimate reasons for people to want to capture um, or kill animals like these. Pest control is a very valid reason. Um, and we'll look at that a little bit more closely. And then also for research. And again, we'll look at that one a little bit more closely. There are other reasons that people will capture these animals. And I truly hope that they get a lifetime case of shingles. I've had shingles. I know exactly what I'm wishing on them. Is when they're taking them as pets or to eat them. And there are a bunch of reasons why this is a really cruddy idea. Um, I mean, do you like pandemics? Because that's how you get a pandemic right there. Um, we'll talk about that one in a couple of videos. But like some of these people that are taking these animals and abusing them, I really wonder how much of a threat they are to their communities. Like you're a serial killer waiting for a place to happen. And I worry about everybody near you. What the heck is wrong with you? Other than the greed, right? So pest control, one of the legitimate reasons. Before I start talking about it, though, I do want to point out that this is not an actual naturally occurring situation in the picture. A couple of clues. First, that monkey is fat as all get out. They don't get like that naturally. That happens when they're overfed by the VOs. Also, this isn't a farm. I mean, you can kind of tell that's not a real chicken's nest. The VOs have made up a fake chicken's nest, filled it with eggs, and put it down in front of some temple monkeys to try and get some more views. Because that's what they do, is they set up situations to try and get the monkeys to act a certain way so that they can get more attention from us. So we have a couple of different situations where the macaques are pests, obviously in farmland situations, like they're trying to pretend this one is up here. And we have to balance farmland versus wildland and how are those two areas interacting with each other? What's our feedback here? City pests, we have to deal with how they got there, do we kill them? Do we relocate them? What do we do to get rid of them? And how are we going to keep them from coming back? And then we also have to be concerned in a lot of these locations about tourism. Because a lot of people come 
to those countries, especially us in the West, like North Americans, we don't have primates. So we get way too excited when we see a primate of any kind. We're like, oh my gosh, it's a monkey. I want to touch it, which is a bad idea, but that's how we are. So we have to balance that for revenue because people come for them, but they can also be very dangerous. And we have to worry about breeding because even if we take them out of their location, if they're still able to reproduce, they're just going to regrow, right? Oh, the colony's going to regrow, I guess. So farmland pests. The first thing I want to point out here is that this whole area used to all be green. And obviously you can see now that it is not all green. And that's because we've gone in and we have made our own, you know, structures and things in these places. So the animals are experiencing and have been for a long time habitat loss. They're being concentrated in smaller and smaller areas because we need to have farms. We need to harvest timber. We need to build houses. I mean, we're taking care of ourselves and we're the custodians of the planet in a way. So we kind of have to keep an eye on them as well. Um, and another way they can lose habitat is through climate change, especially down here along the coast and the cardamoms. Um, this is a mangrove forest area. If the sea level rises too much, it's going to kill off the entire uh, forest of mangroves out there, and then they lose their entire habitat as well. Another problem with the farmland pests is their habitat is fragmented. Like I said, that whole section in there used to be all green, but now we have these big sections, right? Corridors and things through here that are no longer all continuous. They are smaller, isolated islands of habitat. And the animals sometimes have to get through those areas. Sometimes they migrate, although macaques are not big migrators. They typically stay in one general vicinity. They do want to go around a little bit. But more importantly, mating requires that the males be able to get away from their home troop and go to another troop to reproduce there. Um, and if their habitat is too fragmented, they have no way of getting to another troop that can cause inbreeding. Um, the mountain lions in Los Angeles, there's a park in the middle of Los Angeles that have experienced this problem and they are caught in this vicious cycle of inbreeding that is causing so many genetic problems for the entire group of them in there um, that the city is having to get involved or has gotten involved. And of course, when they're cut off like this, they can't get to all of the possible resources. Um, it, again, not that they migrate all that much, but they can't get to certain places, they're still going to miss out. Now we're looking at city pests. And, and some of you probably remember, there have been a lot of these videos, especially during the pandemic, of I have to live in a cage because the monkeys had been fed for so long, right? So where are these animals coming from? And why are they so aggressive? They're coming from us mostly in the cities. When we're talking about in the big cities, these are animals, some that have come in from the wild, but mostly we're looking at um, expats that have been dumped in a park and the descendants of those expats that have been dumped. Uh, they're all interbred. They're all very aggressive because they've been trained not to fear humans. We've been feeding them for so long that they're not afraid of us anymore. And so they know they can get away with being aggressive with us. I mean, you can see very clearly that the shopkeeper in that picture is quite frightened and I'm sure they're picking up on that and know they can get what they want. So how do we get rid of them? Because they reproduce very quickly. Um, if they've been fed well, I think we saw a three-year-old mom giving birth or maybe she was four. Five is typically maturity for them. So it does not take long for them to start reproducing and they have a baby every single year, typically. So maybe culling is the answer. Maybe we need to just go in there and kill all of these animals. We need to thin the herd, right? Well, we tried that. Or more specifically, Malaysia tried that. Um, for a couple of years, they were culling about 70,000 macaques each year from 2013 until 2016. The problem is it wasn't doing much. There was very little impact because as soon as they removed one troop, another one would move in and take its place. So relocation. Well, there's a couple of problems with relocation. One of them namely being it's not going to prevent another troop from coming in and taking their place any more than killing them will. 
Uh, but sterilization, we'll come back to here shortly, is a very good option. And I'll explain why. It's very similar to the feral cats that I'm working with and that right mare. One of the kitties is sitting by my feet. Her name is Mary and she's very pretty. So relocation. A couple of problems with just relocating a troop. The first one is NIMBY. Where are you going to send them? Nobody wants them in their backyard. Not in my backyard, right? People do not want these animals to be dumped in their farm because they are still pests. <clears throat> and we want to keep the families together because if you're tearing apart families in the relocation, you're doing even more trauma to these animals and they're already going through enough. But relocation is very time and energy intensive. You've got to use live traps, lots of people. And again, where are you going to send them? It's really a problem. Some of them can be relocated to, like Phnom Tamal, the zoo. Everybody recognizes this fat little booger who was constantly fed and teased and antagonized by the VOs. Idiots. Try not to say really mean things about them, but I really don't like these people. Um, and he became very aggressive with tourists and was biting people. And so they had to relocate him. They took him to the zoo where he's doing great. <clears throat> and again, we have to think about the balance of tourism here. When we're doing relocations, when we're doing the calls, you got to remember that a lot of tourists, especially from the West, are going to want to see these animals. So, you know, they come to take pictures of and laugh about monkeys sitting on their back and all of that stuff, because that's what they do. Um... You know, but we also don't want them getting so acclimated and aggressive that they start attacking or biting people because they have very long canines. So they can be very dangerous. So in terms of locations for relocation, um, let's start with here's the Cardamom Mountains, the big sanctuaries. There's actually another little one over here. There's sort of one big complex. Um, but there are also a couple of other sanctuaries around. Our two main hotbeds of activity when it comes to these monkey videos at the temples and in the pet situations are in Siem Reap, which is where Angkor Wat is located, and then in Kampong Cham at Phnom Bro's temple. Um, and in the surrounding areas is where a lot of the really, really, really bad offenders when it comes to abusing these animals are located. There is one other nature preserve down here underneath Ton Le Sap. I think I pronounced that correctly. It's been a long time since I took French. Mm, excuse me. So there is another small nature preserve down here. And when the big cull was done at Phnom Bros down in Camp on Cham, it was probably there that they were being taken, not necessarily to the farmland nearby, but to that sanctuary. But again, it's a really, I mean, look at this map. It is a really long distance from either of these spots from here or here you know, you got to come around. It's a long drive. That's a lot of gas. It's a lot of people. Relocation isn't always the best plan. Sterilization, however, works. So just some pictures of the sterilization process. And in our neck of the woods, there's actually, I just saw it today, a truck that drives around town and goes to locations with feral cat colonies and does the TNR in situ and releases the animals right then and there. Just like in this situation, the animals are given a tattoo that indicates a that they've been spayed or neutered and what kind of spay or neuter was done um on cats we just tip the nick the ear tip but in this case they have to do tattoos and then once they've recovered i mean they're doing this in place they're not taking the animals anywhere so it is a large amount of work in one place for a day or two but once the animals are sterilized and re-released they cannot reproduce anymore However, just like the cats, here's the important part. Studies have shown by just being there, they prevent others from moving into the area. And because they've been fixed, there will never be another baby in this group. So no more new guys coming in because we've already got an established colony here, but they're not reproducing anymore. So this is really the best way to go about it if it's possible um, to help deal with macaques as a pest you know in combination with cutting off the source you got to deal with the people who are taking them as pets and then dumping them later or the problem's just going to continue recurring 
Now we do use these animals for research and there are some legitimate uses for them. But as a rule, when we're doing research, especially for human medicine, we're looking at very specifically bred lines where they have taken individuals with certain traits that they want and bred them in such a way to isolate that trait and eliminate any other variation, genetically speaking. So these aren't going to be the animals that are taken from, you know, the streets of, of Seam Reap. These are very controlled animals that have been bred for this for generations to reduce genetic variation. So they may be looking for a specific trait or they may be looking for a specific disease or disorder that they're trying to study. Because we're so closely related to a lot of these primates, they will develop some of the same problems that we have, such as Parkinson's disorder or Huntington's. There's a bunch of different things. But what's really important is that these animals are virtual clones of each other. By the time that the line has been established the way that the researchers want it, the animals they're working with are all genetically almost identical. They're as close to identical as they could possibly be. And that's why we use animals that have really short gestation times and why we don't use people um, to test this stuff because you got to get rid of as many variables as possible. And I do want to point out that we don't ever start with testing on macaques. We're not going to start testing on primates. When we come up with something new, we start with testing on cells, usually HeLa cells. And if you don't know about the HeLa cells, definitely read up on Henrietta Lacks. I ran out of space. Henrietta Lacks, she's the source of all these HeLa cells and they have been absolutely groundbreaking in all sorts of research. So we start with those and then we move up to larger vertebrate like mice. And again, mice breed so quickly that they can do this whole virtual clones thing quite readily. The other time that they will capture macaques or monkeys in general, primates in general for research is when they're looking at studying the animals themselves. For that, they need truly wild, non-urbanized, non-interbred. So they're not going to be taking them from the temples. They're not going to be taking them from the cities. They would go to a, you know, one of the protected forests with permission and capture a set number. So none of the animals that are going on in any of these videos are involved in research. It's all just greedy, like sadism. I don't know. So it, while it's not ideal, there are reasons that we do it and they're fairly valid. And we get a lot out of it. So Huntington's disorder, it's a disorder that both humans and monkeys can uh, suffer from. And because they've been studying these animals and they've got, you know, a line of clones that are all prone to this disorder, they can watch them very closely. And when it starts to develop, they can start finding it earlier and earlier. So you get an earlier diagnosis, which gives you more treatment paths and more options for treating these. Um, Alzheimer's disorder, it's another one that's really close to my heart because this is something my father is dealing with right now. They've, and with Alzheimer's, it, there's a specific protein that develops in the brain and it's what causes the problems. The research they've been doing with these different primate lines has helped us to identify that protein um, and pick it up sooner. And if you can identify it and get rid of it sooner, or at least mitigate it, you can possibly prevent the damage um, that the protein causes that leads to the dementia and the mental decline. Parkinson's disorder, the primates has, have helped us um, develop this deep brain stimulation surgery that reduces the tremors. And there's a bunch of other places that we've used primate research to make big steps in stopping leprosy, HIV, the MMR and Hep B vaccines, diagnosis and treatment of PCOS, breast cancer. I mean, so many places that this has helped improve the quality of life for everybody. But the way that we treat these animals is bad. And that's partially because greed, but also because the rules suck. I'm not going to read these rules to you. You can read them if you want to. It's kind of dry. You can also go to this link here um, and read the whole thing. All of the text in the next couple of slides comes from this page. And it's really good. It's a really good write-up. This releasechimps.org is great.
But the big problem here is the rules are very, very vague and they don't really protect the primates to their best interests. It's just a bare minimum. So they have very small cages. They don't get a lot of interaction. They may be isolated. And this one, vicious and overly aggressive. Well, this is commonly caused by them being kept in isolation. They're kept in isolation. They're very social animals. When they can't socialize, they get vicious and aggressive. And then they get put in isolation for being vicious and aggressive when it was caused by their being isolated. So it, it's really no good. And you can see in this cage here, here we have it, the five by five by seven and a suspended tire. And that's all this animal has. And the only interaction they're getting is that person right there. It's not okay, right? So it's, and again, vague, it's full of holes. They can make changes at the discretion of the vet involved or the people involved for the study. They don't put enough emphasis on the care and keeping of these animals. And it's bad for them, and it can lead to a lot of problems. Now, there are some labs that are better than others. Not all of them suck, just most of them. Some of them have actually put some effort into giving the primates a reasonable quality of life, as well as, you know, the work that needs to be done with them. And you can see here, you know, they've got large cages. They have shelter, but they're allowed access outside. They can get fresh air, perches, climbing structures, all sorts of things, right? And they have each other. There was a study done in 1959 that I want to highlight because it's really going to come into play when we start talking about the pet situation. And this is Harry Harlow's very infamous study. It was done in 1959 where he tested out the maternal connection, basically, between the monkeys and their parents. And so he took the infants and gave them to, they put, put them in one of two conditions, in a cage, you know, in an enclosure with a couple of fake moms, basically, construction surrogates. And one of them would have the bottle and the other wouldn't. And what they found was that even when the wire mother had the bottle, the baby would spend its time on the cloth-covered mommy with her, her, with that mommy, and then only go over to get food from the wire one before coming right back. So they really attached to their moms, and they recognize faces. It changes their personality quite a bit. So here's a picture, kind of some examples, as you can see, we have the soft cloth mommy. And even when the wire mom has the food, baby's going to stay with mom because mom is safer. He also had a situation they called the pit of despair, where they put the animals in with no surrogates at all. Um, when they took the infants that had a surrogate mother and placed them in a new situation, as long as the surrogate was around, they were much bolder. They'd go out and explore um, you know, interact with things and then run back to their mommy. I make finger quotes when I say that. If they were put in there alone, they get very scared. They are paralyzed with fear, huddled in a ball, sucking their thumbs. This is what happens when an infant macaque has been severely traumatized. They will look like that. So let's look at some examples of this, shall we? Oh, a terrified baby. I wonder why he's terrified. Because the jerk that captured him is abusing him. Yes, I'm calling you a jerk, dude. You're awful. Hot garbage. This little female also in the possession of some really hot garbage people who have been beating her and she is just cowering on the ground because she has nothing. She has no protection. She has no support. She's scared because she's been abused. Same with these other animals. <clears throat> some of you may recognize them. This particular chode likes to use the basket as punishment, as a bed, as a carrier. And you can see this poor little guy is just absolutely terrified because chode face has abused him. Same with this poor little man. I feel so bad for him. Horrible humans. Horrible humans. Horrible people doing this to these animals. So one of the things that can develop from this abuse is this thing called floating limb syndrome. And this happens typically because of the stress and isolation where they start moving on their own, the limbs do. And if you've watched any of the videos of Angkor Wat, and again, I don't encourage it, don't encourage them. Um, there was a female that was dropped off at the temple a couple of years ago. She was very young and she constantly strokes from the top of her body down with her back legs. 
she is exhibiting the non-aggressive form of floating limb syndrome. So she has been a very traumatized most of her childhood. And now, of course, she's being traumatized by these awful VOs. Um, in the more aggressive forms, when it's gone on for longer, they will start to bite the affected limb. They can cause serious damage. Um, and we've also seen the same behavior triggered by amphetamines. Where the animals will sometimes just sit with a limb sticking up in the air or in weird positions or stroking their face. So what's going on with that female that I just mentioned is probably she was kept as a pet, drugged with ketamine. There's our amines. And um, developed this floating limb syndrome as a combination of both the ketamine overdoses and the abuse. So we're going to end today's little chat with the definition of the word pet. And in our next video, we're going to talk about why these animals are not pets and what crappy things these terrible human beings do to these animals in pretending that they're pets. And it's all very stupid. So we'll end with the definition of a pet, a domestic animal kept for pleasure rather than utility. We're going to ignore a typo in my next definition and read it correctly. Domesticated, adapted over time as by selective breeding from a wild or natural state to live in close association with and to the benefits of humans. We'll pretend that's a V. These animals have not been domesticated. They have not been bred to work with us. They are wild animals and they come with their own slew of diseases and issues. And they shouldn't be in our homes. We shouldn't be keeping them as pets. And we sure as hell shouldn't be putting diapers on them. So with that, I will finish by saying thank you for watching. And if you have any questions about my sources, please check down in the comment or in the description as I have a big, huge, fat list. Or you can pitch a fit about it and sound like a chode without ever having looked. That's all up to you. Have fun.